my name is Helen Anthem. I'm technical specialist for gender livelihoods and governance within the livelihoods and governance team at Fauna and Flora International or FFI. I've been at FFI for about 10 years now and prior to that I worked for CAFOD which is one of the main UK development NGOs where I was involved in some gender work and I brought that interest with me uh, when I joined the conservation sector. Um, so I'd just like to take a very brief moment to reflect on the roots of the international conservation movement, which was established during the colonial era. FFI itself was established in 1903 as the Society for the Preservation of the Wild Fauna of the Empire. And in her series, uh, Engendering Eden, Fiona Flinton wrote that conservation policy was led by man. Uh, so perhaps this is one contributing factor to the historical exclusion of women in conservation. Of course, FFI has done, undergone something of an evolution itself, a transformation since 1903. And there are now more women than men in FFI's senior management team. And gender is one of our core themes or approaches within the conservation and livelihoods team. Um, there are other signs of progress. My role for a start, gender uh, came formally part of my role just this year in March and my job title. There's a lot more profile and discussion around gender both inside and outside of FFI. Many organizations now have uh, gender policies when I first joined FFI, I could find only one, which was IECNs. There's a lot more disaggregation of data, um, and more and more project reports are referring to men and women and the different outcomes they experience, rather than talking about people and communities. Um, there's an increased interest in what I term women's projects and women's empowerment, although I think some of these are still based on a rather narrow understanding of empowerment and tend to focus on economic empowerment. And I believe there is a need to go beyond women's projects because on their own, they have limited impact on gender equality. But nevertheless, I was encouraged to see that in FFI's 2017 conservation report this text and picture on the left appeared and to my knowledge that's the first time that women's empowerment has been mentioned in such a high level report for FFI. Um, more work and attention has been given by staff to support women's participation in projects based on an understanding of the barriers that women face. And uh, myself and my colleague in the Livelihoods and Governance team are receiving more requests for support. So all these things might appear to be small steps, but um, for FFI, I think we've made quite a lot of progress over the last decade. And um, we're not near gender equality yet, nor gender transformative approach, but um, we're making small steps. But I do think more attention needs to be given to the quality of women's participation. Uh, is it nominal or is it interactive and empowered participation? And I think despite a lot of progress around um, understanding what gender is, there's still a tendency across conservation NGOs generally to focus on women rather than gender and I will come back to that. Um, so what has brought this about? So obviously the world has evolved and changed and conservation has changed with it. There's a lot more focus now on community participation 
and human rights. There's been development in conservation policy, as Andrea referred to. And um, donors are now increasingly insisting that projects include gender. Um, there's a lot of collaboration across sectors, including with development NGOs, particularly at project level, and also with academic institutions. And all those factors, I think, have contributed to the changes within FFI, but also I would like to acknowledge um, the work of the Livelihoods and Governance team in promoting gender. I think FFI's quite unique organisational culture has helped, um, because even though there was nothing in my terms of reference previously and no formal gender policy, I was supported as an individual to work on gender and to explore project ideas. And over the time I've been at FFI, there's a definite increase in the number of individuals who are interested and engaging on gender. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a, a small grant to work on gender with a partner in Northern Kenya. And I think that helped to raise the profile and interest across the organization of gender. So what is con constrained progress? Well, many conservationists are natural scientists. And perhaps for some men are seen as a nat natural conservation partners, but in any case, all of us are affected by our own cultural and social norms, and we all have unconscious biases that we're not aware of. None of us are immune from that. Um, this focus on women, I think it is necessary, um, as are women's projects because of their disadvantaged position, but on their own, I think these type of projects have limited impact. Obviously, they have significant impact for the individual women involved, but they're unlikely to challenge existing gender norms and dynamics. And similarly, I think there's a need to promote more than activity-specific participation. Um, so women's participation is a partial solution, but on its own, it's not enough. We need to carry out gender analysis, and we need to respond to this analysis within our projects and programs. So lack of analysis is a constraint, and um, it, it tends to be inadequate and uh, only carried out at the beginning of projects. And also, even where there is um, interest and engagement, it often slips as the project progresses in the face of other demands. Um, I've been told previously, less so recently, but uh, that it's not our place to interfere with other cultures and that by working on gender and promoting women's uh, empowerment and equality, um, that is what I'm doing. But in my experience, it tends to be people from outside of a culture that expresses concerns with regards to working on gender. And I think we can uh, work on culture, work on gender in a culturally sensitive way by working with local men and women, um, supporting them to affect change and working with them at a pace that they're comfortable with. And obviously, lack of funds is a big issue. And despite donors um, requiring extra attention being given to gender and gender integration, they don't necessarily provide the resources for doing so. And it becomes another demand on already stretched staff. And it's not just about funds, um, it's about other resources as well. And often within, develop, uh, within NGOs, 
the responsibility for gender is given to just one person, whereas it should be the responsibility of all staff in an organisation. Um, so what difference does this make? Um, I'd like to talk just very briefly about the project in, Gen in Kenya that I referred to. Um, and one of the activities carried out was discussions around gender with groups of men and women. And the facilitators um, initially felt a bit of pushback. There's this perception that women can't, women can't be leaders, can't make decisions, can't be involved in issues of security. But in even in a relatively short period of time, and with limited imp inputs, that project contributed to a number of positive changes. And these were identified by the men and women themselves. So we know that women are benefiting from work to promote gender integra integration into projects because they tell us. And as noted previously, we're increasingly collecting disaggregated data and ensuring that surveys and assessments explicitly seek women's views. Uh, but within the conservation sector, I think we're less good at making the connections between conservation outcomes and social outcomes. So we collect social data and we collect biodiversity or natural data, but we struggle sometimes making the links between them. And I think another challenge is that we tend to use the household as the unit of analysis. So we contribute to positive outcomes at the household level, but we potentially miss um, intra-household dynamics, such as the distribution and control of income, food, or workload and how our work impacts on these. However, I think assessing the social incomes of gender integration is perhaps easier in some ways than making the link with conservation outcomes. And I don't think SFI is alone in not having quite reached that stage. Um, and I refer to a working paper where the authors reviewed a large body of literature to identify factors that improve resource governance and conservation um, when women have a say or interactively actively participate in forest and fisheries management. And the evidence suggests that mixed gender groups where women are active and listened to tend to be more effective, uh, have better governance, and therefore increased resource regeneration. Uh, but as noted previously, it's not just about women's participation. We have to pay attention to the quality of that participation. So where are we going from here? I think I will skip through some of these points because um, they're about FFI, but they're not unique to FFI. I just to say that um, within the de development sector, gender audits have been proven to be a catalyst for organisational gender integration and mainstreaming. Um, as I mentioned, there's a need for more and more in-depth gender analysis beyond the superficial. And I think a really great approach is action learning because it promotes both individual and organisational change. Um, but I'd just like to touch upon some focus areas that I think are important for the conservation sector and particularly NGOs to reflect on. Um, this issue about intersectionality. So women are not homogenous. Um, not all men hold more power than all women. 
and gender intersects with other factors of social diversity, such as race, class, and age. And inequality and marginalization is not a result of just one factor. Um, I know it seems like I'm stating the obvious, but um, gender is about women and men. But even so, in practice, I think there's a need to engage more with men as well as with men, women in working towards gender equality. Um, talked a bit about the quality of women's participation already. We need to think about how women and other marginalised people and groups participate in pro processes and the structural and systemic barriers that prevent them from empowered participation. And this includes thinking about cultural and social norms. So working with and supporting local people, men and women who are seeking to make positive changes in their own culture and societies. Um, so I think it's helpful to think about the gender integration continuum. I think a lot of conservation practice has been accommodating, so it uh, works around existing gender differences and inequalities, um, becoming increasingly gender sensitive, so understanding gender differences and norms and doing no harm. But what we should be aiming for is gender transformative approaches, so strengthening and creating systemic changes and addressing historical biases. And I think there also needs to be more work around how gender equity and equality relate to the recently developed frameworks around equity in conservation. So thank you.